Good morning, and welcome to worship at University Christian Church. My name is Russ Peterman, and I am part of the pastoral staff here, and it is my deep pleasure and great joy to welcome you to worship this morning here at UCC. This is a congregation, a community of faith that embodies and takes seriously our sense of inclusivity. So we want you to know that whether you're a longtime member of UCC or a new online viewer, that wherever you are this morning, that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, that you are a child of God. And we are thrilled that you are here this morning. We are starting this morning a new series that we're calling, Now What? And what we're discovering is that that is, in many ways, the quintessential question of Easter. How do we live as resurrection people, especially in the midst of this hurting world? I hope as we begin our time together this morning that you will take some time to create a a sacred space around you to clear out some of the distractions, that you will gather some bread and perhaps a cup for communion. I also hope that you will take some time this morning to go to our website and register your attendance with us this morning. We have discovered, haven't we, in this time of social distancing, the deep need for a spiritual nearness. And so it is good for us as the gathered body of Christ, wherever we are, scattered across the world, to come together in this moment. And so church, let us worship God together.
As we prepare to go to God in prayer, I invite you to remember that you can still submit joys and concerns to us on our website. There's a place there you can submit those. If you don't have internet access, you can also uh, give us a call here at the church. Our clergy and prayer groups are still praying for all of the joys and concerns that come in each week. So I invite you to submit those. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. You, amazing creator, are the God of all that is seen and unseen. You sustain us with the knowledge that you are our fortress, the mighty rock of our salvation, the foundation upon which our hope can rest. And while we know that nothing is hidden from your sight, Scripture tells us that you are unable to be seen with human eyes, that you are mighty and immortal, living in unapproachable light. In the brilliance of sun-drenched creation and in the void of deepest night, in the wide and long and high and deep love of Christ in whom we are created as your handiwork, we come to you in both your certainty and your mystery, bringing our doubts and insecurities, our frailties and our failings, knowing that even in the midst of what we don't know, what we can't see or touch, and all that we can't comprehend, you are there simply loving us. Sometimes we may not believe that simple truth. Help our unbelief. Give us security that in your mystery there is boundless grace. That in your Holy Spirit there is unending love. And that in your Son there is everlasting life. It is in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Christ, that we worship and pray, saying the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So each of the four Gospels ends with the story of Jesus' resurrection. Except that the story may close, they don't really end. And each of the Gospels invites the reader into further action. For instance, Mark invites the reader to take up where the women of the tomb left off and to share the good news that Jesus, Jesus has risen. And in Luke, he, he shares Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit and his charge to the disciples to go and to be witnesses. Matthew records Jesus' commission to proclaim the Gospels to the whole world and to promise to be with them until the end of the earth. And then in John's Gospel, he reminds his readers that the whole point of this story is to help them believe that Jesus is who he says he is so that they might believe, that they might find hope and live in this understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so while the Gospels may end, the story that they tell continues on. Which is why the quintessential question of Easter is essentially, now what? How will we live knowing now that, that death has been overcome? That the worst things are not the last things? How, how will we treat each other now that we know that God loves us beyond our wildest imagination and that God loves everyone in the entire world the exact same way? What will we now try? What will we attempt? What will we dare knowing, knowing that the risen Christ is with us? 
Now, according to the liturgical calendar today, uh, we are in the season of Easter. Easter is not just a day, it's an entire season, the last 50 days up until the day of Pentecost. This morning, we are starting a series based on that very question, now what? And we'll ask what it means for us now in the midst of all of the uncertainty that we find ourselves in, amongst all of the anxiety that is caused by this COVID crisis, how do we live as resurrection people in the midst of this hurting world? I understand that now what can be a frightening question, especially with all of the unknowns that are among us. But rooted in the Easter promise, the promise of resurrection, it can also be an exciting, it can also be a a compelling question that invites us to live in new ways, to open up opportunities of how we might live with gratitude and hope instead of worry and fear. The scripture story that you're about to hear this morning comes from John's Gospel, and we pick up the story later on the night of Easter. John tells us that the disciples are all in hiding. They're behind locked doors, afraid for their lives. And Jesus comes and stands among them and shows them his wounds and his scars, the places where he had been pierced. One of the disciples, Thomas, was not there. And that part of the, that detail becomes important in the second part of the story, which takes place a week later. We encounter the disciples again, and this time they are trying to convince Thomas that Jesus really is alive. And we live with the understanding that that up to this point, all week long, Thomas has believed that Jesus is still dead. He's skeptical. In fact, we even call him, what do we call him? Doubting Thomas. I think Thomas gets a bit of a bad rap. He's more of a realist than a doubter. He's skeptical. And if we're honest, isn't there a little Thomas in all of us? Don't we all question from time to time our our, our faith, ourselves? Don't we want proof, proof that we can see, that we can touch? So I invite you to hear now this story from John's Gospel. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was the evening on that day, the last day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand, and I put my finger in the mark of the nails in in, in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. So now what? Christ has risen. We've encountered the risen Christ. But now what? Where, where do we go from here? 
I think that question is being asked a lot these days in light of the pandemic that we find ourselves in. Not knowing how long this will go on, how long we'll have to live with these restrictions, when we'll be able to get back to our normal routines. It's like we're living in limbo, just sort of waiting and wondering. We're all sort of asking ourselves our own version of that very same question. Now what? You know, it struck me too after hearing that story again this week. Then in a lot of ways we are like those disciples on that night of Easter, holed up in our homes, afraid to go outside. Suddenly that detail of the story takes on a new meaning. It feels eerily familiar. I think we're all wanting, we're all longing to settle back into what Will Willimon refers to as the reassuring drone of ordinary life. To settle back into the ordinary resumption after this grand intrusion. Sort of like when you're watching your favorite TV program and, and a news bulletin breaks in, how, how thankful you are at the end of that when that voice comes on and says, we now return to our regularly scheduled program. It's what we're all wanting, a voice to come to us today that says we now return to our regularly scheduled lives. But I think what we're hearing, what we're discovering is that we won't be going back to how things were, not completely. It'll be like the program that we were watching is now on a different channel. This is such a difficult, complex situation, and it feels unprecedented. There seem to be so many factors that need to be taken in, so many experts that need to be listened to. And it is so important to pay attention to the healthcare workers and the medical experts, the scientists, as well as those people that are struggling to put food on the table, wondering if they'll have a business when all this is over, wondering if they'll have a job to go back to. I know you will join me in praying for the leaders, for Mayor Price, for Governor Abbott, for those making these incredibly difficult decisions about what's next, about how we move back into some sense of a new normal. I guess what I want to convey more than anything else this morning is that I know that this is difficult for some people. Some more so than others. I have heard from far too many of you about your personal struggles, the hardships that you were going through, about how hard this is for you and for your family, the loss of jobs, the loss of income, the isolation that you're feeling. Some of you are dealing with the illness itself. But I know, too, that some have been less impacted by all this, that some were able early on to, to, to seek the lessons that can be learned, to discover the good that can come out of all this. And still there are some other folks, like me, who have in the past few days felt this need to turn a corner, to turn away from being reactive to living a more proactive life. I have really felt the need in the last few days to turn away from the things that I can't control and to focus my attention on those things that I can control and to turn towards God's goodness that transcends our personal situations. But trust me, I know that that is harder than it sounds. So maybe in moments like this, we can look to others who have been able to do that to, to as Barbara Brown Taylor says, find God in the faith of other people. Mother Teresa, who is now known as St. Teresa of Calcutta, spent most of her life caring for the poorest of the poor, the sickest of the sick, people living, people dying from HIV and AIDS, from leprosy, from tuberculosis. For years, she was recognized as one of the most faithful, one of the most gracious, charitable people in all the world. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1979. She was one of the most faithful people, an honest-to-goodness saint, if ever there was one. But yet, privately, Privately, she experienced doubts and struggle in her religious beliefs, doubts and struggles that lasted over 50 years. 
five decades, until the very end of her life, this saint of our time spent over 50 years living in what St. John of the Cross would refer to as the dark night of the soul. For much of her ministry, she questioned God. She didn't feel God's presence. She sincerely doubted her faith. And when her private letters were released a few years ago, many people pushed back against this reality, says that this can't be true. But yet she said in one of those letters, Where is my faith? Even deep down there is nothing but emptiness and darkness. And if there be God, please forgive me. But when I try to raise my thoughts to heaven, there is such convincing emptiness that those very thoughts return like sharp knives and hurt my very soul. Powerful words. But Mother Teresa... A doubter? That can't be true, but, but it was. Despite her deep faith, she had an even deeper sense of doubt. But yet she kept on serving. She kept on working for the poorest of the poor, the sickest of the sick, helping to relieve the suffering of countless people. I heard Peter Rollins, a great Irish theologian, say about Mother Teresa one time, that Mother Teresa had a resurrection faith. A resurrection faith, the kind of faith that caused her to keep on going even when she was riddled with questions and doubts, even when she didn't feel God's presence at all, even in those moments when she would cry out to God and all she would hear is the sound of her own voice. So what does it mean for us to have faith a resurrection faith during difficult times. How do we live as resurrection people in the midst of a hurting world? Peter Marty, who was the editor of the Christian Century and a great pastor in his own right up in Iowa, he recently reminded me of a figure in history who embodied what it meant to live out this resurrection faith in the midst of incredible hardship. Martin Rinkert was a pastor in Germany in the early 1600s. And before he went to seminary, before he turned to the ministry, he had been a gifted musician, serving, serving in many of the prominent churches in his hometown. But not long after he began his formal ministry, the brutal Thirty Years' War broke out. In the city where he was serving, Eilenburg was a highly fortified city, and so when the invaders attacked that region, refugees from all around flooded that city, poured into that city seeking safety and protection. It didn't take long, though, for famine and for disease to set in and to become rampant. In just one year, 8,000 people died in Eilenburg including all of the other clergy, most of the city council, and even Rinkert's wife herself. He alone had to minister to the entire city. Some weeks he did over 200 funerals. Rinkert gave away virtually everything he had, everything except the bare necessities that he needed to care for his family. He was a true pastor to the people. In the depths of that communal suffering, which, which must have felt a lot like the communal suffering that we feel right now under the coronavirus, Rinkert returned to his musical roots and he wrote a hymn that has become so familiar to many of us with words that speak to us poignantly in this moment. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done, in whom this world rejoices. It takes faith, a resurrection faith, even in the midst of doubts. It takes incredible resolve and gratitude to rise above the circumstances, to rise above the suffering, to live with a, a gratitude and hope instead of worry and fear. Did you notice? Did you notice when it was in the moment that 
the light went on for Thomas when all of a sudden he believed and he understood the significance of that moment. It was in that moment when he was able to touch the wounds of Jesus. There is so much hurt in the world right now. But we are a resurrection people. We follow a resurrected Christ, one who defeated death, who overcame suffering and calls us, calls us to touch the pain of the world and to lean into the ways of God. A love that never ceases. A hope that simply can't be quenched. May we live with a resurrected faith. May we serve as resurrection people in the midst of this hurting world. Amen. Ever since COVID-19 began to directly impact our community, you have asked, what can we do? How can we help? Who can we serve? Over the past month, I have witnessed this congregation come together once again to be God's hands and feet at work in the world. We have been delivering food, delivering groceries to Fort Worth ISD families every single week. This past Friday, we had a donation drive through where people pulled up under the porta cache and dropped off over-the-counter medication or toilet paper, paper towels, cleaning supplies, food that helped the Tarrant County Homeless Coalition. 
and the over 40 agencies that they work with in Tarrant and Parker counties to care for the underserved. This past Thursday and Friday, we also began making 300 sack lunches to deliver to our neighbors at the Presbyterian Night Shelter. We collected the items under the porta cachet, brought them into the church, and a small group of volunteers gathered on Friday morning to stuff each sack lunch with a homemade sandwich that we then took to the night shelter. We have asked questions. You have given generously of your time, of your financial resources, of your ideas, of your Excel and Microsoft Word skills. And I encourage you to go online, visit our website, and learn about how you can continue to help. Make a gift. See where you can serve within the church and also within our community. This is what resurrection faith looks like. This is how we treat others now that we have seen God's great love for us and the world. This is what it means to live as a resurrected people. Let us pray. God of grace and God of generosity, we are so very grateful for all of the gifts that you have given us, for the gifts of talent and time and financial resources. We ask that you bless these gifts May we continue to work together to listen to one another and use them to care for everyone in our community, to serve your children that are most at need. Use all that we have and all that we are to be your light and your love, to be Easter people in our hurting world. It's in Christ's name that we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. I would like to invite the youngest children of God among us to gather around. I have a message just for you. When I was a kid, I loved spelling. Not because spelling was fun or enjoyable to me, or even that I was very good at it, but because spelling was a subject in school that I could predict. I knew what was going to happen each day. There were no surprises in homework. When it comes to spelling, and you might be doing it now online, but when it came to spelling a long time ago, for me, it looked like this. On Monday, we got a list of words. We looked at the words, we spelled the words, we said them out loud. On Tuesday, we wrote sentences using those words. On Wednesday, we might have used definitions for each of the words. And then on Thursday, It was time to cram for that spelling test that was coming up on Friday. It was a big day. It was hard. I spent time. I did homework on Thursday nights preparing for my Friday spelling test. Friday would come. I would take the test. And I'll be honest, after the test was over, I completely forgot about those spelling words. Until Monday came around again and I had a whole new set of words to work with. Lent and Easter or a little bit like spelling sometimes. Lent is this long process of building up to this big moment. There's a crescendo, an increase of excitement around Holy Week, and we experience that together. And then we have Easter, the Easter excitement that is hard to describe, that moment when we realize that Jesus is not dead, he lives, and God's love is shared with us, and we are loved beyond what we could ever imagine. And then sometimes, Easter's over, and we go back to living as we did, kind of like those spelling tests after I took them on Friday. You just go back to living as you were until something big comes along again. But friends, we are called to be Easter excited all the time. Not to forget about that Easter excitement. To know without a doubt that we are loved all the time by God. And to remember how Jesus taught us to live, sharing love, kindness, and compassion with all, caring for all of our neighbors in ways that show that we love them and that we care for them and that they are important. That's the work that we call justice. 
And that's what we're called to do. You see, Easter excitement is what we need to do the hard work that our Christian faith calls us to do, to love others, to care for one another. And we need that Easter excitement in order to do it. And we do it together. We do that work together, and I know that we can do it. So know, friends, that you are loved, that you are cared for, and that God surrounds you in a love embrace that allows you to take that love and to share it in all the world. Sometimes we all need a reminder to stay Easter excited. And Jesus provided that for us when Jesus shared communion with us. When Jesus showed us a way to gather around a table to share Christ's love together, we have that opportunity to re-engage, to re-energize, and be together in Christ's love. So join me now at the communion table. When we gather at the communion table, we are invited to take part in a ritual that reminds us that we are a part of God's work in this world. We have the opportunity as we eat the bread and drink from the cup to take part in that work of God's love. We are reminded that we are people of the resurrection and that we get to continue to do Christ's work in this world no matter where we are or how we're doing it. We are called to God's love and compassion to justice and mercy. And no matter where we're sitting today or staying today, it's our job to share God's love. And so when we come to this table, we are reminded that Jesus, on that night that he gathered with his disciples, took the bread, blessed it and broke it, and said to them, take and eat. And when you do so, remember me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. He blessed it and poured it out for them, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you. Take and drink, and when you do so, remember me. Let us pray. Let us pray. Dear God, in these days of swirling doubt and grave uncertainty, we thank you for bread, for cup, touching, tasting, trusting. We rejoice as we hold hope in our hands. Amen. The bread and the cup are here. We are invited to take part in this meal of Christ, to be reminded of God's love for all of us. All of us are welcome. Let us now take our communion. Thanks be to God. Again, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning, wherever you are. And we hope and pray that this service has been memorable, that it has been meaningful for you, and that at some point in the middle of this service, you have felt and discovered and known the presence of God in a very real way. And now, church, let us go out into the world, even though we are staying home. And let us live a resurrection faith. Let us be resurrection people, even though we are living in a hurting world. And as we go, may God bless us and keep us. May God's face continue to shine upon us and give us hope, now and forevermore. Amen.